All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Making Multifamily Money. So I'm actually very, very excited uh, to have Kelly Cronin on. Um, she was very grateful to give me an opportunity to interview her. I, I'm relatively new in this space, so very, very grateful. Well, Kelly, can you kind of start off with introducing yourself and, and what you do? Absolutely. So my name, as he said, is Kelly Cronin. I actually do extraordinary rentals in extraordinary places. So once in a lifetime type of trips. Um, but you can do them as many times as you want because we try to do them very affordably. And so we have been adding slowly but surely to the different places that we offer these kind of out of pocket experiences, things like going dog sledding in Alaska or uh, going into the brightest bio bay in the world and seeing, you know, baby turtles that are endangered down in Vieques, Puerto Rico. And we've been having so much fun doing it. Wow. Oh, just for some context, I mean, how many, um, I'm assuming short-term rentals, right? Like how many do you right. currently own and where are the locations? Absolutely. So we have a current short-term rental in Kisilof, Alaska that is getting completely remodeled as we speak. The, uh, the other one that we have is a smaller uh, 850 square foot house in Vieques, Puerto Rico that's on short-term rental that is rented out um, almost through, I'm gonna say through probably May, middle May already. And uh, then we have a 80 acre plot in Ladysmith, Wisconsin, that's getting glamping experiences. And that'll have a total of 13 doors when it's done. So think about vintage school buses that are remodeled and vintage trailers and uh, some bell tents and a tree house that opens to the sunrise and the sunset. Okay, wow, that's a lot. That's a lot <laughs> for me to unpack there. Um, um, I guess, can you kind of give a timeline of how you purchased each of these assets and like what that kind of looked like just to Absolutely. give context. Yeah. Well, to give a little bit of context, just to kind of bring readers in or listeners in, we actually, um, I don't come from any kind of money. So I haven't had a lot of savings. I've, I have saved about 50% of my income for my, my whole working life. However, as a veterinary technician, you make 10 to $20 an hour. So it's not a ton of money to start off with. Um, so just keep in mind that a lot of the things that we have done have been on um, a slightly uh, inventive purchase plan. So timeline is, is about two and a half years ago, I put in an offer, uh, uh, an offer to a place in Utah. And unfortunately, that didn't work out. A place in New Mexico for a um, a mobile home park that I was going to turn into a tiny place and that did not work out because there was multiple owners on that title and a, um, a place in Vieques um, and those were spaced offers and they just were not working out we're not working out well come to find out um, at the time that I put in the offer on the Vieques house and that I put in the offer on the Utah house both of those were looking like they were not going to work out and then they both ended up coming back to me and decided to close within a month of each other. Wow. And then <laughs> and then a third offer that had made very off the cuff um, because both of those were looking like they weren't gonna work out um, actually came through for Kisilov, Alaska. So all of a sudden I went from no properties or just my, my main house, which I do have a small rental space in that, to having three properties, which is fairly amazing, four properties total. Um, which is fairly amazing. And the nice thing about it is because of the fact that I vetted these properties in terms of what I really could do, I never over my extended myself even though, um, so the, the property in Utah, I actually was able to get for $17,000 for a tiny home and two plots. Um, found it, you know, found it on market and then that seller backed out. So it was almost a year and a half in between initial offer and purchase. And then the house in Kasilov, Alaska is um, is a dome house. So a rounded geodesic dome house with a lofted bedroom. And that one I was able to purchase for $40,000 outright. So out of some investment money. And then the, the third one, the Vieques house, I was able to purchase on owner financing. So the owner was able to help me finance through. And so got that house for $73,000, but most of that was on owner financing so i had a very small down payment and the nice thing about that is that when you look at the overall value of the property the land itself for either kasilov utah or the vieques property 
all three of those actually the the land without any house on it actually appraises higher than what I paid for them. Uh, okay. So a little bit of creative creative zillowing. Got it. Okay. Wow. I just kind of want to highlight a few points. That's that's very. <laughs> I'll take notes here. <laughs> um, so basically, you know, when you start off in real estate investing, as you alluded to, you make a lot of offers. You get a lot of notes. Yes. Right. You know, like you see your success today, you might see my success today, but I've gotten rejected so many times. It's right. A numbers it, game. It's, it's a numbers it's all game. About how many times you can put exactly. yourself out there because you know you're going to get rejected. And what I tell people is make an offer that makes sense for you. Mm -hmm. Right. And me as an individual, Kelly as an individual, offers may make different sense for us versus a syndicator, an offer might make different sense for them. So just, I always say, just make an offer. And if you consistently make offers, eventually you will get it deals, right? Regardless of the market. I don't care if it's during COVID when it's extremely competitive, or maybe today when people are a little more fearful, it just takes that consistency. Another thing that you did very smart, <laughs> which I emphasize is you bought right. So you bought the property with instant equity day one. Yes. Right. So I do this a lot with my apartments where I'm buying it and I'm coming in with 100 to $150,000 equity day one. So you mentioned that the land itself was already more valuable than what you bought at, which included uh, infrastructure, you know, like a property mm -hmm. on top. So that's another point. And the third point that you mentioned, which was very impressive, was as you mentioned, you know, you didn't grow up with money. You know, you grew up probably working middle class like I, myself. I kept my family was the same way. You know, you're making 20 bucks an hour, but you have the discipline to save 50% of your income. Yes. And that's why I keep on telling people because, you know, right now I make good money as a pharmacy director, but it's all about that margin, right? Like, I don't right. care if you take home. 1000 a month or 5000 a month, if you're able to save 50%, it's just the concept of saving half. Right? And it's one of those situations where if you can grow the gap, you can get, exactly. you can almost do better if you don't make a lot because you are continually keeping that spend a little bit lower. And that spend is the real genius behind growing your income. Exactly. And I, I did the same thing. Like when I increased my income, my spend is exactly the same. <clears throat> So I didn't have that lifestyle creep. So I just wanted to highlight that because people knock on me because they say, well, you make a lot of money, you know, and I do. You were saving before you did. Yeah. And I had a bunch of student loans. That's why I tell people I had $250,000 of student debt. So, so I mean, you know, I had to overcome that hurdle first, but that's why I kind of find your piece very inspirational that, you know, you basically had 20 bucks an hour job. That's very relatable. And despite that, you're able to buy your property you know, 17,000, 40,000, like and you bought that. And then you did your last deal, creative finance, because maybe at that point you might've used up all your reserves and creative finance is a great way to basically buy deals of low to no down. But can you kind of give how you even approached, I guess, the creative financing or how that kind of played out? Like how did it go from start to finish? Yeah. And, and what I'll say is that the creative financing really came into play or came into my my view because of the fact that someone asked me for creative financing with our house in new mexico now the house that i owned in new mexico was actually on uh it was on pueblo land and so you lease the land from the from the indian tribe and then the house sits on it and it's it's a little bit tougher to buy it's a little bit tougher to sell it's a little bit tougher to rent it's just it's tougher but you get these incredible places in a very, very high cost of living place like Santa Fe, New Mexico. And we lived right next to a lake and we lived right next to an apple orchard. And it was just absolutely beautiful because we didn't mind having a little bit of a creative place to be. And when I went to sell it, it was very difficult to sell. And I, I had actually had a um, renter in it for quite a few years. But what I was able to do was work on some creative financing to help some homeowners uh, actually purchase it from me. And what's nice about that is that when you are a seller, you know, especially if you're having any kind of difficulty selling, if you have someone come in with a seller finance deal, and if you can actually afford to buy out that mortgage to the point where, you know, you don't have a mortgage that potentially would not allow that that allows you to actually get all of the interest that you would come into that the bank is normally getting out of that home sale 
And it potentially is helpful to a seller who's trying to offload a property that's a little bit tougher to sell. And so when we're talking about the house in Vieques, Puerto Rico, um, what happened is it was listed, it was on the market for a little while. And I think that a lot of times those homes sit on the market for a little while because in this case, it it's a situation where you have to own the house 10 years before the title can transfer to you. And so that's a really tough house to sell. Plus it, it just needed some updates and some love, but it was a great, great house. And so coming in there, I was able to offer just a little bit less and and it was really less than what anything in the area was going for so it's it's totally how that house was marketed but when i came in i was able to talk to peter and i i was able to say you know what do you need out of this sale versus what do i need out of this sale i want to make sure this is a win-win for both of us and he said well i just need enough so that i can move to the main island for health reasons well that's fairly easy like I can pay your rent for a couple of years by buying your house, no worries. And I gave him enough down so that he could buy his significant other out of the house. And then um, and then he was able to take that remainder and take it in timed out payments. I didn't extend it super long. You know, he really wanted it to be done in five years, which is totally fine because it still makes an incredibly small, you know, monthly payment. But then if I have a monthly payment that's going to him, a, it doesn't decrease what I'm able to um, borrow for other projects because it's not on the books anywhere. And B, it allows my monthly tenants to actually pay for that property so that it's paying my mortgage. So I'm not necessarily on the hook for it. I do want to make sure that all of my monthly payments come under a, a certain amount that I can afford if I lost my job or something like that. Right. So I just want that safety, that modicum of safety. And I like the idea of having multiple of those just because of the fact that that allows me to lean on one if, say, short term rentals got canceled another. Or in the case of Utah, when we found out that Utah thought that it was too small to be a house, even though it was amazing, you know, we could let that that property go and not do with that income from that property and therefore, you know, put that money into something else. So we just really make sure that as I'm looking at each of the different properties, you know, that I'm really thinking about, hey, what's the ultimate outcome and how do I help that seller get what they need, help me get what I need? Wow. Okay. No, that 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 is genius. I, I kind of want to highlight a few points because I, <laughs> I did creative financing for my mobile home part, very similar mm -hmm. to what you did. But what's really nice and what sets up creative financing is being able to talk directly to the owner as the buyer and the seller. That's why I hate, I hate working with brokers because once you put a middleman between you, it's so hard to communicate directly. It's so hard to build trust and it's so hard to just like build a relationship to create win-win situation because you were asking, how can I help you? Right. Or even you, you were trying to sell your property and you're like, I have this problem. How can I make it easier for a potential buyer to buy this off me? So you have that investor mindset. I, I did the same thing, right? When I saw my mobile part, I already structured creative financing for them. You can assume this first loan and I'm a seller carry second a little bit as well to help reduce your down payment. Cause I know that's going to be an issue. Yeah. So you're thinking steps ahead of like, as an investor, usually they think, oh, we're buying. Right. But also to exit, if you need to exit creative financing works well, where you kind of lay it up on a platter and it just takes a certain buyer that it will attract. Right. But you already did all that legwork for them. So I now, think that's to be that's clear, cool. though, with both of those, those were through realtors. So there were realtors involved. Um, the nice thing about that is that if you do a little bit of research on your realtors and just say, hey, you know, this is this is what I'm doing. This is how I set up my my purchases. Are you open to that? You'll find a realtor that's really open to working with that. Uh, can't say enough about our realtor down in New Mexico uh, and our realtor. Uh, a realtor in uh, Vieques, Puerto Rico. They're just incredible people who, you know, who recognize that you have to do things a little bit differently when you're trying to build up a business. Okay, great. No, I'm glad. I'm glad you mentioned that. So, I guess when I was talking, it was more like 80 percent. Like the moment you say creative financing, they automatically turn away from you. Yes. Yes. And what is that all about? <laughs> that's been my experience with like apartments. I'm like, you know, I'm doing apartments and uh, mobile home parks and. Like you would think like in these larger assets, like it's more common, but the moment you just say it, like you're already on the bottom of the list and they are going to shoot the deal to like 200 other investors. But 
you know, you're able to find that 20% realtor and they were able to negotiate that. Cause I believe me, a lot of times I have to teach the broker or the realtor about creative financing. And I can already tell the moment I'm already talking to them, they're not even listening. And I know they're not even going to say it. And they're just going to be like, I asked and th by them asking, they probably just shot a text message. And then the guy was like, I don't understand what that is. And if people don't understand, they say no. So you, I think you did well in getting a realtor that understood what you wanted to do and was able to communicate that. Because for me, like the moment you throw in another person, like it just throws the whole thing off. So for me, I actually got all my deals direct to seller. I don't use brokers for all my assets. So I, I would say that that takes a certain skill. And I would say once you find a realtor like that, you treat them well because <laughs> it's, it's, it's a relationship based business. And then another thing that I thought was, was, you know, really smart what you did was, so in that Puerto Rico, it, it was basically, you had two hurdles. The seller had two hurdles, essentially. One was they have to own it for 10 years, mm -hmm. right? And maybe they're year five out of 10, right? And then number two is he was motivated because now he has health issues. Correct. That's usually motivation for creative financing. It's usually, I think I call it like the four Ds, like death, divorce, disagreement, or disability. I think those are the four Ds. The moment that happens, there might be more motivated to sell. So you were able to come in, you saw the problem, right? You gave him a down payment that was enough to get him to you know, go to the States. And then at that point, he's getting monthly income from you, right? So he's paying his mortgage, but then you're maybe paying a little bit on top of that. So he might profit a little bit. And that's mm -hmm. going to help subsidize his expense when he's at the States. And then now you get an asset where you load down. You know, you have a monthly payment and hopefully when you rent it out through short term rental, you know, that's your spread. Correct. So that 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 is um, really genius. <laughs> I want to highlight that. But I guess if you feel comfortable, do, do you mind kind of sharing high level numbers of like what it looks like? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, before we do that, though, just one other thing, one other point about the, the alternative financing. What I'll say is that the four Ds certainly help you. Absolutely. However, when you're talking to some folks who are potentially not as educated about the alternative financing, one thing to think of is that there's also a huge tax advantage. And so when you're talking to someone who potentially has multiple properties or someone who needs some type of tax get out for that amount that they're, they're going to get from selling that property, that's another really big motivator for them is really have you know, have someone at your back who can talk to the the tax implications of doing an owner buyout versus doing a, a complete sale, especially if they've made a ton of money on, or they stand to make a ton of money on that new purchase. Um, so talking a little bit about this, I don't really have numbers for the other locations because we're clearly still in in process with um, the house in in Kasilov, Alaska, mm -hmm. still in process with the land in Lady Smith, adding different uh, different things like showers and such. But to give you a little bit of background on the Vieques house, so we are um, currently paying you know the remainder of the mortgage, which is six hundred and twenty three dollars a month. Um, purchase price total was seventy three thousand. We did ten thousand dollars roughly of improvements. So all in was eighty three thousand dollars. And we make in the twenty-three to twenty-four hundred a month range. Wow. Now there is a, an occupancy slant for two months, so October, November. Um, there's an occupancy slant because of the hurricane season. We are we have enough time invested now and enough direct bookings now that we are able to generally fill that up for next year. We're already starting to get some low income um, bookings for next year for that time frame. Um, and so what I'd say is that if you if you annualize that $2,400, we sit in the $1,900 range. All of our cleaning actually goes in a separate pot because that's you know paid for by whoever's staying there. And uh, in terms of maintenance, it brings us down to about $1,600 a month that we make. Um, and so with that, you know if you if you take off. Uh, and look at your percentage, we're sitting right in that 2% range, which is pretty good. 1% is what, you know, we all kind of aim for. And that really tells you guys to look at how much you're getting, you know, net income per month versus how much that total 
purchase price and any kind of updates that you might do to a property is. And that percentage really guides whether that's an investment that's going to do a little bit better than sitting in market, your money sitting in market. Yeah, no, th thanks. Thanks for sharing that. So I, I guess out of, out of my curiosity, um, so do you typically do direct booking or do you go through Airbnb? Like how do you advertise it or is it a combo? It's a combo. It's a combo. What I'll say is that what we do is, is make sure that we get guest information from the initial booking, which we can because we do safely insurance, which is a per stay insurance. And it's the only thing that'll insure that house in Vieques because of the fact that it's, it's wood and it's on an Island, a hurricane Island. And so, with that short-term rental insurance, we do have to have guest information for them to vet the guests and for you know for us to vet the guests for that short-term rental insurance. And so with that, that gives us access to their emails and to their phone numbers. And we gather emails for every single person in the house as well as mailing addresses. And we really try and, um, I very much try and monopolize that, right? Capitalize on those items by sending them, you know, pre-gifts like magnetic bracelets for the black sand, magnetic sand beach, you know, Playa Negra, or by sending them, you know, Christmas cards with pictures of the beach, or we have postcards made for our house, um, advertising our house and, and advertising anyone who gets that postcard can use it for a discount on a future stay. And so we do a lot to drive um, a lot of attention to our direct booking because I don't really like to pay someone else to do, you know, subpar marketing mm -hmm. and subpar guest management. And so everything that I do tries to drive guests back to that booking. And what we'll do as well is we'll sometimes have a, a different check-in time, like an earlier or later check-in time. But in order to do that, they'll have to book directly through us. Um, you know, we'll advertise the direct booking site instead of the Airbnb link. We do a lot to work on that. And uh, what I'll say is that we're roughly in that 60 to 40% range. So right now it's a little bit Airbnb heavy. It's about 60% Airbnb, but predominantly most of the year it's 60% direct bookings, 40% Airbnb. Wow. Okay. No, that, that, that's great to share because you're not dependent on a platform, right? So you're giving incentives for guests to go direct booking, whether it's checking in earlier, because that's always a big one, right? Like yep. I arrived at like, you know, 10 a.m. and I can only check until three. It's nice to be able to just go check in immediately and you're giving that yeah. incentive and you're sending gifts. <clears throat> that's that's very smart. That's very smart marketing. I guess how does property management work? Do you are you working with a company? Are you self-managing it remotely from afar? Like how does that what does that look like? So I am a huge fan of of automation as much as I possibly can to the point where as I was learning things about the different um, places that we were setting up, you know, any of those automations that I had or any of the ways that I set up the automations, I always want to record that so that if I ever bring on a virtual assistant to start, you know, moving into that role that I already have everything set up for them. And so all of our messaging is automated. Um, we do have automated messaging to our our caretakers who do any of the flips on site. Um, I have an army of folks who do any of the things that I need them to, including truck repairs, including, um, you know, putting in a new toilet the other week, <laughs> um, including, you know, dealing with the fact that the water got turned off on Vieques Island. We were able to get past that because I have an army of people who can help me with, you know, attaching the cistern or, um, you know, dealing with whatever comes up. And, I keep that army of people, you know, very near and dear in a document so that if I ever have to go away for a vacation or something along those lines, if I hire someone in, they can do all of those things because they have instructions on every single thing that we do. And actually, um, because of the fact that I'd done so much work on that, I, I created a short term rental class that I have on our website as well, just because it seems as though you know, that economy of scale is really the way to go. If you already have all these things written, including cleaner checklists and including, uh, you know, turn checklists and in turn, including all of the copy for any of your, um, you know, any of your advertisement, all of that is duplicable. Exactly. No. So I, I really like how you mentioned that. Cause I'm actually very systems oriented as well. So mm -hmm. basically you try to automate things, and it takes time, right? You know, obviously when you first started to where you are today, 
uh, you learned a lot along the way. You said, okay, I can automate this, right? I can automate direct response. I can automate the cleaners knowing when to come um, to clean after a guest leaves. I can automate a checklist of what they do. And of course you need backups of backups, right? If one cleaner fails on you, you have a team of backups. Same right. thing with general contractors. That's what I advocate too for my apartments, all right? If one property manager doesn't perform, I have two backups. If one general contractor doesn't perform, I have two backups because you never know what happens, right? Like life happens, maybe one of the four Ds happens. And so it's always nice to have a team. And then also you want to automate yourself out of the out of the position. So if you want to, you know, step aside and you know, for me, I'd invest for lifestyle as well, right? I, I, like that's my end goal uh, when I'm more stable exactly. is just to have lifestyle to say, I don't want to work anymore. I have the option not to work, or maybe I want to step away from my rentals for like a month and just enjoy it, right? Yep. So, but since you have these systems already, you can easily bring on like a virtual assistant and teach them. And then basically at that point, you automate yourself out so you can free yourself. So it's, that's very, very smart. And that's what, it's probably leads to your success and why you're able to self-manage it because you know i do the same thing i self-manage my single family homes in california and at this point it's so simple where like it just requires me like i get a text and i just text like their handyman like and then mm -hmm. i'll be like all right well you call the tenant and you guys coordinate a uh, date and time to fix it and that's all i do right and, and then it becomes very easy so i think people why i want to emphasize is people just freak out like myself included like oh it seems like a lot of work Right. But if you have that systems and you learn the processes, um, it's easy. And like you said, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You, you could learn from other people who are doing it and shortcut your way to doing the same thing. So and just to be clear, I have a I have a 60 hour a week job. I have a very like right now I do multi-site veterinary management and mm -hmm. I have a very intense and you know time requiring job. And I do other things on the side, you know, I speak at veterinary conventions and, uh, and all kinds of things. I help other people with their listings. And I have all that time because of the fact that I can manage in a very time exclusive way. Okay. No, I'm glad I, I didn't realize you were working as well. So, so basically what I love, cause I work too, right? I still work a full-time W2 and I have 90 units of real estate, right? So each in itself is a full-time job. Right. right. Um, but because we are working at W2, it forces us to be very efficient, to be very systems oriented and almost automating ourselves out of it as much as possible. So that is a silver lining. And that's why I tell people it's OK to do both because it forces you to be very efficient. Right. Like there's things that you learn because you're like, hey, I'm out traveling, speaking. I'm working 60 hour weeks. You know, same thing with me I, I, between my commute and my job at 60 hours a week. But despite that, I'm still able to manage my rentals and each of the create systems around your lifestyle that works for you. So Absolutely. no, I'm, I'm really glad you said that. <clears throat> um, so here I kind of want to pivot. So I, I know you kind of dropped a little bomb uh, with your 80 acres uh, in Wisconsin uh, of glamping. And, you know, I own a mobile home park, which is 55 acres. And, and I know, oh my God, it, what it takes to just maintain <laughs> that amount of land, like, can you kind of talk about, I guess, how you got that deal, how you financed it? Um, what's your vision for it? And, you know, just kind of share all about it. I know it's a lot there. Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> you're, you're going to laugh. Like we kind of fell into the, the land. We were actually looking for a small section of land so that we had a place to park our school bus that we're renovating into a, a living space so that we can travel full time and, uh, and you know, really enjoy moving between rental and rental, which doesn't work well when you buy one in Alaska and one in Vieques, neither of which can be gained by a bus. But yes. <laughs> but um, with that, we just needed a place to park it. And so I was looking for land to park it and I found some two acre plots up in Northern Wisconsin, which, you know, we, we both come from there. So it would have been a phenomenal, you know, little addition to, to give us some place to to go and work on it and to to camp in the summertime etc cetera, etc cetera. well the the three different places that we had looked at did not work out because they were actually lower purchase prices than what our compensation to the realtor who was looking for them would have gotten so speaking to your like don't bring a realtor in i would say that that definitely definitely comes into play when you're looking at smaller pieces of land 
so what we ended up doing was we ended up talking to the last realtor that we were talking to and said, hey, like this is really what we're looking for. And he's like, well, I know it's not what you wanted, but I have 80 acres in Ladysmith, Wisconsin. And <laughs> Ladysmith is where all of our families are from. <laughs> and so it was it was just a lot to look at how affordable that it was less than a thousand per acre and it was just a really phenomenal piece of land with a river running through it and it's so pretty and it's got a little pond on the edge of it and it's just it's it's perfect it's so perfect and um so we we talked to the seller and we told him about wanting to do seller financing as well um, we did a 5% down. He had a lot of land. He really needed to think about that tax advantage when we discussed it with him. That really made him very open to the idea of doing seller financing. And so it's, it was really how I couched that argument with him. Um, and clearly, you know, you have to do that through the realtor. And so in that case, you know, I just really lined it out in an email to him, which I had the realtor forward on. And I would very much suggest having them do that as opposed to letting a realtor speak for you just because of the fact that you know what seller financing can do for that seller, um, a realtor might not. And so as an investor, you know what that investor potentially needs out of that sale. You can really outline that into an email and get them to agree. So very graciously agreed to sell it to us. Now, we had to put a uh, a driveway in. We're going to be putting in a septic and a well. Um, we we need to get a little creative with some bam beavers, some beavers that have moved on to the property. Um, so we're going to be talking to them <laughs> and and making them move. Um, and then uh, after that, it'll be cutting some trails. We did have a gentleman who helped me design topo topographically all of the trails so that we can have a trail around the outside that'll have family activities at each step. So for example, there'll be an outdoor art studio. There'll be a BYOB dry, um, dry hooch area so that you can bring your alcohol and sit at a, a little outdoor cafe or bar. There's um, life-size chess at one of the stops you know, just some really fun, uh, fun things. There's a, a tree hammock so that the kids can bounce up and down on this little tree hammock. It's super fun. And it gives, it gives everyone an idea of, hey, what it's like to have a family vacation that is comfortable, right? It's not mom and dad sleeping on the ground and yelling at the kids to be quiet. It's, it's actually comfortable because there's real mattresses and there's real roofs over your head. But to also, you know, be disconnected enough to reconnect with each other. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Okay. So you know you're just looking <laughs> for two acres and you just bought eighty, right? That that's yeah. a very very logical sequence. Um, no, I, I, I love that. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, um, the owner I'm assuming owned the land free and clear, or was there yeah. still a loan on it? Yeah. So because he owned it free and clear, basically the owner became the bank, right? They yeah. basically upgraded from the landlord or they just own a bunch of land and now they become a bank. And what I love that you said, and that's what actually I do too, and I forgot I did it, was you drafted the whole email and made it so easy the realtor just needs to forward it over. Yes. So because I do the same thing, I, I have the bad habit of I'm harder on realtors and brokers in my channel, but I'm just like, they're just literally just pressing forward uh, <laughs> yeah. for me and getting commission for doing that. But what you probably explained, which is smart is, you know, because for me, I actually calculate their capital gains tax for them. Like if yeah. you, you just Google what is the long term capital gains tax for the IRS, there's like a step ladder. Like the first 50,000, it's zero. The next, you know, segment, it's going to be maybe 10%. The next segment's 15%. So I will literally calculate it out for them, breaking it down for them and said, hey, this is how much capital gains tax you will pay if you sell it immediately. Right. Yep and at least make them aware you know if they need the money that they might need just to get bought out and then at that point pay the capital gains tax but if they don't need the money immediately they can get it in segments right Correct. so that's what i like to explain is you're only paying capital gains on your down payment that i give you and the monthly interest payments that i'm giving you right so that's well, really no smart. time value of money means that that money is worth more as we keep going as well now the nice the nice thing about that too is that when we're talking to when we were talking to that owner, he was actually ironically the president of a bank. 
Oh. And so, <laughs> it was, it's definitely one of those situations where, um, you know, you, you might feel a little bit funny explaining something like that to someone else, but it's always worthwhile because I, I don't think he would have thought outside the box enough to have sold it that way had we not brought it up. Yeah, and like for me, I always bring it up, right? Like every time I, I talk to any owner that I approach, I always, I mean, of course, I'm not going to come out the gate with creative financing because it might turn people away. But sure. once I understand more pain points and try to create one with situation, that's when I'll kind of pitch it. I just said, hey, like for me, I usually approach of, hey, a lot of my wealth, the wealthy owners that I work with, they actually like doing creative financing because it helps save them on tax. And then you pause and then they're just like, what? Like, tell me more. Right. Yeah. And then once you start explaining like what you did, like, hey, it's how much tax you're gonna pay. And, and even if they work in real estate, whether they're a broker, banker for like 20, 30 years, it might be foreign to them still. So it's always worth to ask. And the worst case is no, right? Like I had one owner, he told me no like 10 times, and I got this deal rejected by like 10 banks. And finally, after getting rejected by 10 banks, he was like, you know what, Steven, let's go of the option that you suggested. Because he he yeah. he knew that I was earnestly trying to help, so um, so curious about back to the eighty acres. Like, did you raise money for that? Is it just you that you self funded it? And I guess how did you fund all the other renovations that needed? Because I know like adding driveways, septic wells, it's not cheap, right? I know that with my mobile home park. How did you go about like financing all the other stuff? Absolutely. Yeah. So for the initial purchase, I actually used some of the income from our Vieques house to do the down payment. Uh, so one deal funds another. Yes. Um, as far as the monthly payment, I'm self-financing that because it's just such a small, incredibly small amount of monthly payment. And then as far as any kind of improvements, those have been predominantly self-funded some finance through you know through income from rv Akis house as well and what i'll say for um for some of them too we've actually done a heloc loan on our current primary residence um because i was able to get our primary residence on um it was actually on foreclosure so i bought this house at one hundred and eighty thousand dollars. it's worth four hundred and sixty thousand dollars right now according to my taxes or five hundred and eight thousand dollars according to the most recent sale here in the neighborhood i think it's probably worth a little bit more than that just by the fact that it's double the size of the other house mm -hmm. and then it actually helps fund a lot of this as well because i i actually lease out a section of it it's a three-sectioned house and so one section is a efficiency with a kitchen it and with a, a bathroom and that leases on uh, midterm rentals for 900 months so that's been helping to kind of stash a little cash so that we can do some of those things as well but the heloc has been helping us through some of the big renovations okay no i i, I really i'm glad you shared that because you know i'm kind of doing the same thing right like people ask like how do you scale so much without other investors because when people think a lot of units you're automatically thinking oh someone's syndicating or someone must have partners or you're raising private money but what you did was you basically use the cash flow that you had you're still working and you use that for the five percent down right mm -hmm. the fact that you can negotiate five percent down it allows you to go in about partners right versus if you have to do 30 40 at that point you might have to bring in partners so that was smart. And then number two was you leverage your current assets that you own for a while. So you got to, you know, HELOCs are a lot better on primary residents. Um, I just discovered that HELOCs are back for investment properties. So that's going to give me a lot of access as well. But basically you bought this leveraged so you don't have to bring in a partner and now you have full control of this asset. And that's what I'm about too. Cause like, I'd rather be a little bit smaller, but have full control versus grow larger and relinquish some control and relinquish the decision-making. So I'm very on much on that train right now, but maybe later in the road, I might, I might pivot. But so I, I guess when you kind of bought this 80 acres, like was it currently making income or did you have to like slowly start building stuff to generate that income? And I guess, what does it look like like currently today? So currently it's still without income. Um, it will have income soon just because of the fact that we've had some folks who've asked about 
um, about doing summer parking there. What I'd say is that we, we're currently in the process of just cutting that first well, cutting that septic. So we don't have an infrastructure there for anyone who can't, you know, can't dry camp effectively. And so it has paid for some things by, you know, providing us deer meat. My, my significant other went up and used it as hunting land, which, you know, that was, that was fine and dandy. Um, but that's about all it's done so far as we're getting the infrastructure into place. Yeah. So why I asked that is because, you know, because I have a mobile park, it takes a lot of money and a lot of time up front to make it very successful, right? Like right now you're paying interest to the, to the owner, right? Right. Those yeah. payments continue. And then plus you're pulling a HELOC to finance these things, right? To build the well, to build the septic, to build the driveway, to build the infrastructure, down the road or eventually to buy your clamping tents, right? Like this all is yep. going to cost money. Um, so you're eating it, right? Essentially every month you're paying these expenses and it's gets discouraging, right? Like, like I feel the same on my mobile park. I'm pumping out money every month and I'm not seeing a return yet, but it, it takes a very long-term perspective and being able to withstand those monthly hits, right? Mm -hmm. And being able to know that, Delays are going to have, I'm sure as you go through it, you're going to hit multiple delays, right? You're trying to build a well, maybe it's snowing. You can't <laughs> build it. Maybe you're trying to build a septic, maybe it is a delay for the manufacturer, right? Every single delay can happen. So, you know, I just want people to know that context where like, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of effort, but if you can get through it in, you know, five years, whatever, how long it takes, it can be life-changing, right? It can be life-changing where, you know, you can go there for yourself and camp hack or you live there, use your amenities, but it can also be like a cash cow, right? Like where it might be, you bought for 800, it might be eight to 10 million, right? In, yeah. in five to 10 years, but it's to take a lot of work, a lot of grit to get there. Well, so. and the good news is, is that, you know, we have, we choose some, we choose places that are potentially not on the beaten track. So we're not paying a lot to get started on these. Okay. So as a as an outlay of eighty thousand dollars for that land and then an additional um i think we paid six thousand dollars for the driveway we'll pay a ten thousand dollars for the well and septic that'll be an, a total outlay of you know right in that hundred and ten thousand dollar range when we finish all the trails and such and for a hundred and ten thousand dollars each of those doors as we open them will get 130 to 140 dollars per night wow. now that's a pretty incredible ramp, right? So even if I get one or potentially two of those doors open at the end of summer, you know, that's already working our way towards paying that off. And yes, it's a very seasonal area, sure. Um, but hey, it doesn't take too many seasons of it being open in a seasonal area, getting that kind of income to really get to where we need to get to to actually pay that off. So. I just, I look at these places and a lot of people don't want to do, you know, something so out of the way or something so bespoke or, you know, something that's that's more difficult to, to run or rent. But when you look at, when you look at it, if you, if you advertise it the right way, and I really don't think about it as advertising, I really thinking about, think about it as sharing the magic that you feel mm -hmm. when you want to go to these places with somebody else so that they can see the vision you know, it is, it's absolutely those types of things that out of the wayness, that bespoke nature of those, those places to stay that make them so special to someone else. You know, it's going to be impossible to get Wi-Fi out to Lady Smith, Wisconsin. It's just not going to happen. I'm not even going to try, yeah. but the people who are going to want to stay there are going to want to reconnect with their family. They're not going to want to connect to the to the Wi-Fi, right? Like it's it's time spent around a fire. It's time spent, you know, re-establishing re those connections that potentially you lost. You know, memories weren't ever made by watching reruns. It just isn't a, a isn't a thing. So it's a situation where if you can look at a situ a situation that presents itself to you, and you can say, "Gosh, this is maybe not, you know, not the middle of." South Beach, right? Or it's maybe not the most desirable place in the whole wide world, but if you can see the magic of it, somebody else will too, and somebody will come specifically for that. 
Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. So what's really smart that you mentioned was, yes, you are taking a negative, but you basically calculate that you probably need about maybe two or three of these, these sites set up before you maybe start breaking even. And then anything beyond that, that's when you start to see your cash flow. Correct. Right. And then, I mean, do, how many sites, I guess, could you potentially build on these 80 acres? Like, is there zoning or is it just a matter of like, does it just fit? Like, how does that process work? It's unzoned and unregulated, so I could build 100 sites on these okay. 80 acres. Am I going to do that? Absolutely not. We are planning for 13. 13. We don't want we don't want enough sites for everyone to feel like they're at a campground. We want enough sites so that everyone feels like they have a piece of the forest. Yeah, got it. So, so, so basically, if your vision is to have 13, you just need three to kind of break even. I call it mm -hmm. so that 10 beyond that. That's all the positive cash flow. So, and then what's really nice about you and what, what I want to highlight is you never once really talk about the money. You're more talking about the experience and the memories that are made. If you notice the whole conversation and everything we talked about, it was never about the money. It's always about the experience because what you know, it's word of mouth marketing and that's what compounds, right? Oh, absolutely. So we'll, they'll take nice Instagram photos, post it. And they're like, wait, where's that? Right. So now it's going to attract people to come. And like you said, it's really that experience where you want to feel like you're in nature, but it's comfortable. Like you're remote, Absolutely. but it's very comfortable. So I think that's one thing that you probably mastered <laughs> that, <laughs> which is why all your you know, short term rentals are successful, as well as why this glamping will be successful. But you also did it in a very calculated way where you know that, you know, I can finance all this, I can take the hit. And you know, maybe being negative for a bit until sites are set up, but you ultimately see the end vision and in, in building that. So that's that's really, really, really impressive. Um, with that, um, we're I definitely guess feeling that negative hit, uh, that ramp up in Alaska because it's just so hard to get things done up there. And so it has actually we've owned it for the same amount of time as the Viacus property, but we're just getting to the second phase of the build out for it. And so, you know, just getting water to it. So just yes. getting well hooked up, just getting the septic in, the septic has to be redone. You know, we have this amazing yard that's all planted wildflowers. Well, we didn't get to see that last year. We planted the wildflowers last year. So it'll be this year that we see the wildflowers bloom. You know, it, it's taken, Two, two trips now to get any kind of windows in. It took us months and months to get a bathtub in. But when you go there and you're able to soak in a soaking tub and like mix your own bath salt from the bath salt bars, or when you're able to, you know, relax in the upstairs lofted bedroom and look out of the 360 degree windows out at the yard, watch the moose play. And we have a moose and her two babies live in the backyard. And uh, they're probably all grown now, but um, and watch the northern lights from your bed, you know, from your big cozy comforter, it'll make it all worth it. And beyond that, if you choose places that, you know, you can't wait to get back to yourself, like someone else is not going to wait to get back to them themselves. You know, I get so many messages from friends who are like, I saw your pictures. <laughs> How do I get there? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No. So what I kind of want to highlight from what you just mentioned is that, you know, like a, when you listen to a lot of podcasts, like you just hear the end result. Right. And I fell into that trap where I'm like, oh, you know, I bought 10 units in two years and I'm retired making X amount of cash flow. And then I'm looking <laughs> at myself. I'm like, wait a second. I bought like 80 units in one year, but I'm negative because I'm <laughs> fixing all these things up. Right. So I mm -hmm. think what people miss the message, what I'm trying to spread is that you know, in the beginning, it's not going to be easy. It's going to feel bad. Like you're going to feel like, wait, why am I bleeding every month? But that's why I emphasize don't quit your day job just yet. Right. Like have that day job. So you have at least some money coming in. And it's more of a psychology of knowing that I have money coming in. So it feels good. So I can kind of eat this negative while it's happening. And it buys time because real estate needs patience, right? It takes time to build an experience and what you're building. It takes time to renovate an apartment complex. What I'm yeah. doing, it takes time to build a client base where they want to go to your short term rental. It takes time for all these things. Right. And I know it's hard because if you're 20 and I'm, if I'm asking you to wait two years, that's 10% of your life. Right. So <laughs> that may be difficult, but just know that if you can take that negative 
keep on pushing forward despite because I, I I agree sometimes I wake up I feel bad right it's not it doesn't feel good to be negative money but if you can kind of push through that and then make it successful like you will look back five years from that point and be like I'm just, that's the greatest decision I ever made so I think I the the point is you know short term short term pain shouldn't shouldn't impact your long term profit. Right. Exactly. Don't allow the short term pain to stop you from long term profit. And then the other thing to think about is as you're holding on to that that W-2 job, I'll tell you the reason that I'm still in a W-2 job because I could afford to pull off of it. The reason that I'm in it is because it gives you legitimacy with any kind of um, you know owner financing, any kind of bank financing, any kind of HELOC. It gives you the legitimacy to be able to leverage your money that you're not going to have from a short-term rental or from a long-term or mid-term rental um, portfolio because the the banks do not know how to look at us yet. Yes. Give it time, but right now they just, they don't know what it looks like to be us. And so until that happens, you need that legitimacy or you need to be able to self-fund, one of those two things. And even if you're able to self-fund always make sure that you've got your hedged bets, right? If you're looking at a short-term rental, make sure that it makes sense as a long-term rental or flip as well, because you never know what tomorrow is going to bring in terms of these games. Exactly. No, I'm glad you mentioned those points because, you know, the fact that I have a W-2, it makes it so easy to get HELOCs, lines of credits, better interest rates, right? If they have any doubt about you, like, like for me, when I first bought my first apartment complex, a lot of the lenders will say we want experience but you're stuck in that catch 22 is how can i get experience if i can't buy my first deal <laughs> right but then what happened was i went off market and i brought the bank such a great deal that they didn't care i had no experience because it was yeah. such a good deal with instant equity day one two hundred thousand equity day one i'm like if i fail you take over this property you can flip it for two hundred thousand dollars yeah right but on top of that the fact that I had a W-2, they can say, okay, well, this guy's brand new. He brought me a good deal, but he has a W-2. So they look at the whole picture of you, right? And just yeah. having that W-2 gives the underwriters a little bit more certainty. And sometimes that's all you need to push it through. So I'm glad you highlight that because a lot of real estate investors give W-2 a bad rap, right? Or like, I'm buying real estate to leave my W-2, but the longer you can overlap your real estate with your W-2, the bigger the foundation you can lay. Because I know if I were to leave my W-2, I'm going to open as many lines of credit as possible because I know that's when lenders love me. And the moment I don't have it, yeah, my tax returns look terrible because, you know, if you're doing a lot of renovations, like what I'm doing, my tax returns are going to be like zero it's gonna look, or, or negative, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're spending money renovating and then you do a cash out refinance. It's all tax free. They don't see the money, right? Yep. <laughs> so like, yeah, like they look at your tax returns and they're like, what the heck is this person <laughs> doing? So I, I'm really glad you said that it does paint a better picture for you but also it does give them something to grasp on because they don't understand anything outside of the v2 unfortunately right they just see good w2 okay this guy makes money he can make the payments and also for seller financing even too right mm -hmm. it comes in a position of strength when i can say hey i'm taking x amount per month right so even if the property doesn't rent i can cover it so and that's I'm, even a little bit more more so with the owner financing because when you think about an owner financing you know generally that owner is the one who's vetting you in terms of your ability to repay and so i'm never going to hit a point where i can you know where i can say legitimately to an owner like hey i have this income stream and and be able to prove it as well as having a w-2 exactly so like you can say like worst case if my plan doesn't work my w-2 can cover it so it gives them a comfort because like you said 95 percent of america has a w-2 yep right whether you hate on it or not 95 percent have it so people understand it and it just eases them right because like you said they're they're becoming the bank and they're vetting you just like how the banks vet us they're yep. the bank and they're vetting you so if i'm trying to get seller finance from kelly it's the bank of kelly like what makes kelly comfortable with me, Steven, right? So it's mm -hmm. building that trust. So I think that's what you mastered. <laughs> it was made you very successful. So, all right, Kelly, you dropped so much value today. Thank you so much. I, I guess the last question I typically ask all my guests is, what's one thing that kind of made you successful 
and what you would kind of advise newer investors to do? So leaping before you look is clearly clearly my superpower. Yeah. Um, I've bought most of you know I've bought most of everything that I've ever bought sight unseen. So even our primary house here in Milwaukee, you know, we were not able to see the entire house per, prior to purchase because it was a foreclosure. And uh, this, you know, listed as two bedroom house turned out to be a 5,500 square foot house with 21 rooms. Like it's, it's enormous and amazing. And um, I did the homework. So I don't want anyone to think that leaping before you look, you know, negates doing homework. Make sure that you understand that financially something's going to be a good deal. But don't be so scared to make a move that, you know, just make sure that if you make a move, no matter how that move turns out, if that house is falling down, that it's still going to be worth it to you. You know, make sure that you've got that hedged bet. But leap before you look once in a while because you'll end up with a beautiful geodesic dome in Alaska or a crazy roundhouse in Vieques, Puerto Rico. And, you know, you never know what you're going to find um, by just, you know, taking a little bit of a chance. No, I'm, I'm glad you said that. And leap before you look, you own 80 acres, right? <laughs> so right. so <laughs> it, it's, it's like, you know, what you described was you're taking calculated, like you do as much due diligence as you can. But as you know, as I know, you learn the most by taking action, right? Yeah. Like you can take all the courses, all the mentorships, and you're learning two out of 10. By owning it, you're probably learning eight out of 10. By making a mistake, you learn 10 out of 10. Right. Right. So that's how I learned. Right. And I took the leap too. like, if you asked me a year ago, would I do a mobile home park? I'm like, what? What's that? Right. <laughs> but once I learned about it and I became open to it, that's when you dive in. And then just by doing it at that point, you realize what not to do and what to do. And maybe you may not like it. Right. For me, I'm the type where I have to try before I know. Yeah. So, you know, I wouldn't know about like mobile home parks before doing that. So no, I'm glad you said that because I think the most successful people, I think there's a study, the billionaires, your threshold from when you know something to when you take action, the shorter that is, mm -hmm. that will correlate with your success. Like we're not gonna be completely reckless. Like we're not gonna say, hey, dive in head first and you might go bankrupt. No, no, don't do not do that, right? Like hedge, the keyword was hedge. So we hedge by buying with instant equity day one. We yep. hedge by having a plan of being able to force appreciation we hedge by having reserves, whether that's cash, whether that's a line of credit, whether that's having a W2 job, right? So yes, we're saying take a leap, but we also have all these things behind the scenes that are hedging us. So no, that, I'm glad that's, that's actually great advice. Um, well, we you, clearly don't let failure stop us, right? So we yeah. fail fast and we fail often, but we also plan for the times that we don't. Exactly, and like by failure, you know, as long as you can get back up, right? So the mm -hmm. analogy I give, you're, you're getting me off on a tangent. I love this analogy. <laughs> if I fall off a 30 foot cliff, I'm dead. I cannot survive. I only have one try to fail. But if yep. I fall from one feet, I can fit, fall 30 times from one feet and still get back up. Right. Right. And okay. you've learned how to fall the right way. Exactly. So make sure that your fall, your failure isn't going to be 30 feet where it wipes you out. Right. Minimize that the height as much as possible so you can keep getting back up. And if you can do that over the your whole career, you'd be very successful, right? So I'm, I'm really glad you said that. So, all right, Kelly, I guess I'll put the links down below, but how can people get a hold of you if they want to? Probably the easiest way is by our website. So www.croninscastles.com. We're on social media at Cronin's Castles, Vieques Sea House, uh, in a nutshell, Alaska and uh absolutely connect with me however you like kelly get dot uh kelly dot lynn dot cronin is my gmail you're certainly welcome to hit me up with an email and ask me anything i love working with people who are just getting into it who are mid midway into it who want to i don't i don't care where you're at in your journey connect with me i, I love to make some friends who are doing the same thing and like-minded Awesome, Kelly. And once again, I'll drop those links um, down below in the video. And thank you so much. Sounds great. Thanks. Thank you. Hit stop.